Are you ready? I'm ready. Sure. Okay, now if I look goofy, you gotta say something. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna have to do this all over again. Uh, my name is Al Ducharme. I'm one of the founders of Hoverfly, and I now serve as the Chief Technology Officer. I'm Dan Burroughs. I'm one of the founders of Hoverfly, and I'm currently the Chief Software Architect and Chief Information Officer. Okay, I'm Steve Walters. I'm President and COO of Hoverfly Technologies. Uh, Hoverfly started with an idea, uh, the vision of which was to solve large-scale industrial problems. Hoverfly today is tethered drones that can stay over a position for a long period of time and provide communications coverage as well as surveillance um, and situational awareness. When we first started, the biggest difficulty was that we were somewhat alone out there in the industry. And I, I shouldn't say quite that way. There are other drone companies, other, other people that were getting started at the same time, but the drone industry was really in its infancy at that time. And that meant that we couldn't rely on other people's work that it already existed. We couldn't just go out and buy a product. It didn't matter how much money you had. There were things that just didn't exist. Not that we had the money to buy it if it did at the time, but we had to uh, do so much work to invent and build the fundamental infrastructure and the fundamental tools that we needed to build the system that we really wanted to have. I had a student come to me, one of the founders, George Sapp, uh, needing a project for his senior design course. And I had seen hobbyists starting to play around with the idea of using multiple rotors. So instead of a single rotor helicopter, multiple rotors. And uh, suggested that we could use sensors from cell phones and brushless motors and make a multiple rotor helicopter. Uh, George was into flying helicopters. I was into remote control aircraft. And we, uh, you know, kind of came up with this idea of a flight controller for multiple rotor um, aerial vehicles. And George went off and, um, you know, I helped him with the senior design. But after the senior design project, uh, George kept on, uh, you know, uh, enhancing and improving the technology to the point where there were a lot of people in the, in the remote control uh, aircraft world that wanted a device that they could fly with multiple rotors. And that was really the, the genesis of the, of the whole thing. Um, as soon as George showed that there was a market for this, we came together and formed Hoverfly in 2010. This is an interesting question to me because I always like think about what is hoverfly and like the you know the terms of the history like we make flying things at one point and at you know at one point in time that was that was enough it was a, you know people were amazed by that it's something flew great you have a product but as time has evolved we have become so much more of a of a integrated embedded product into people's systems where we provide them this ability to have these new capabilities, new ways of using their existing systems, sensors, uh, cameras, radios, whatever it is, and be able to do something with them that they couldn't do before and have become, have kind of gone from being this thing that was a very like noticeable, very out there, new technology, shiny, bright object type company to becoming more of a, of an basically like an embedded infrastructure type company. We provide 
capabilities that are at the core of what our customers are doing, even though you know we still have this kind of fancy flying shiny object doing it. We, uh, we got a little stir crazy today. We've been writing code and uh, so we decided to try to fly a FedEx box. Um, pretty simple. Hoverfly Pro in here. Got some really cheap speed controllers, a little wire harness, and uh, four Rimfire 300 motors. Uh, one thing we had a little trouble with was the propeller size because you can see most of the airflow is blocked here by the FedEx box. So when we put the propellers on, we needed some long ones, but they were too long. So what you want to do, this is a little tip, if your propellers are too long, you just want to get in here and cut them off with a wire cutter. And that way they won't hit, because the first time we built it, of course, they all hit. Um, when I look back at the path that I had that got me to uh, where I am today with Hoverfly, it, it, it's... Uh, it, it, it's kind of strange because it sort of seems more planned than I remember it being at the time. And then there were people I knew and some of the other founders, Al Ducharme, Stacy Ducharme in particular, that Al was somebody who had a strong electrical background. And, it, and he had been, these two people had been friends of mine for ages before this. We had always been looking, we'd all been involved with different startups at different times and had always been kind of in this entrepreneurial world. And we're always looking for something to do together. And I had this embedded software background. Al had the electrical background. Stacy had the business marketing background. And we met one other person who had the idea of he wanted to build a, fl a flight controller and with his idea and our expertise just came together to form a really uh, just a great initial team to start this vision. Oh! Man down! Man down! So I joined, I think I was employee number 11 or 12, um, and uh, initially joined just as a consultant to kind of help, and then came on um, uh, to, to help lead the team. Drones only fly for 20 or 30 minutes when they're battery powered. By providing them with a persistent power source, the power over the tether, they're useful for flying hours and days or even weeks at a time. And so they can perform a variety of complicated long duration missions that battery powered drones can't do. If you can operate an elevator, you can operate a hoverfly tether powered drone. We had just kind of had a change in ownership. The, the business model had shifted from uh, building flight controller boards to building tether drones. So we had early stage tether drone systems and uh, our job, the, the company's job at that point, was to mature that technology and, and, and of course, to sell it. So uh, we had, had uh, um, investors. We had, uh, um, I, I think we were just early as far as our technology. Um, so we didn't, um, we didn't have customers who really understood what tethered drones were or what they would be used for. So we had to do a lot of uh, educating in our sales pitches, and but we also had to mature the technology. So there was a lo lot to do to mature the technology. So that's where I jumped in, and, we, and a big part of that was forming the team and keeping the team moving in one direction. We wanted to do something meaningful, uh, but we wanted to create a company that would create jobs and be scalable and investable. And when we started, we had basically a hobby technology, but in order to get it to the bigger markets, we really knew even at that time we needed to create a base technology, flight controllers, build that into turnkey drone systems, and then go after large scale markets, government being one of them. We heard over and over and over again that Flying for 15, 20 minutes just didn't meet their needs. They needed to fly for six hours. That wasn't going to be possible with you know, current state-of-the-art battery technology. So the idea of tethering it came about because they also said, we don't need to fly around. We just need a camera 
100, 200 feet off the ground. And so if that's the case, then there's no reason why you couldn't attach a thin wire to the craft. This is new technology. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot of different drones out there, but tethered drones is really a new technology that people are, are just now trying to, you know, getting their arms around as, as far as what this technology can do. So when, when, when you start selling to new customers, you can see the light bulb go on. They say, oh, now I get it. I see what these things are used for. And so you, you stop trying to explain what a tethered drone is, and then you start uh, helping them, you know, uh, develop the solution for their mission. So, but in, in the early stages, it's, it's common for companies to go after just sales. You have investors, you're trying to get sales, you have a board and they want to see growth. And so you're, you have a tendency to go wherever the, wherever you can to get those sales and rather than pick an area and focus on that area. When we finally decided to focus on building a tethered drone that, 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 that did really well, uh, that's when things started really, you know, we were able to mature the technology faster because we were focused and then uh, we focused on specific markets and specific customers and then we helped them, uh, they helped us actually develop uh, the technology because we got to know what their requirements are and what they wanted to do. They flew our system and we found out where some of the issues were with our system where we were able to make it better. We went through a ringer where there was some of our customers that would put our system through these endless tests of trying to prove that it actually could do what they needed it to do. And at some point we got past that point and we were then challenged with being able to produce in the quantity they needed on the timetable they needed. And we're getting past that point and we focused so much on that for a while now that I think the next big inflection point that we're going to have in the company is that we have, we are going to be sat here with a system that is very solid, very capable, works in a ton of environments, is very reliable. And so then it's gonna be all about the capabilities on that system. What can we do with it? What are the payloads that we can carry? Whether it is uh, things that our customers have, whether it's things that third parties have, whether it's things that we develop here in house. I think we're going to have taken this thing that started as a bit of an experiment, a, a sort of groundbreaking new concept type product and have turned it into a tool. We've turned it into a reliable tool that is kind of boring in the sense of that it's not like unpredictable or anything like that. It just works. It just does its job. It works. And then it's all about figuring out what more can you do with this great tool that you have. Uh, after getting out of the Army, I worked in a lot of companies. And this is probably the funnest job I've had, one of the more most demanding jobs I've had, but uh, just the culture we have here, the people we have here, um, and the things we've accomplished in such a short period of time have, have surprised me. Uh, we've done things in weeks that take people, month, other companies months or years to do. So I'm just always impressed with, with our guys and gals. They've just done an amazing job. Hoverfly was bootstrapped. It was four people with a dream and a kitchen and a handshake. And it was a few thousand dollars and we grew it from there. Uh, it, it amazes me sometimes when I look back and I think about the problems that we used to have. I, well, I look at our system today and I know all the things I would like to be better about it. I know all the things I'd like to be different. And sometimes it's frustrating that it doesn't do what it does better. And then I think to where we were a year ago or two years ago or five years ago. And it's amazing how much uh, has grown and changed and how much the capabilities have expanded. How about the past two weeks? Uh, the past two weeks, probably 1,500. It feels like it. <laughs> you look at uh, NASA during the space race, um, the average age of the guy and uh, the guys in, at Mission Control was 26 years old. And that, that's just, when you think about that, that's mind boggling because that's the average age. And so you had a lot of young engineers that were, that were part of this uh, you know, historic event. So, and that's what we have here. We have a lot of young engineers, but we have some very seasoned engineers. 
And what I see is, is uh, my dad was, worked at NASA, and I, I actually had an astronaut interview with NASA, and the people that I inter interfaced with there were just really, could tell they were high-performing people. They were intelligent, they were enthusiastic, and what I, what I see in a hoverfly, it, when you define a, a high-performing unit in, in the military, they're agile, they're adaptable, they're intelligent, they know their mission, and they they know their equipment, and they you know what they're trained to do is not necessarily one specific thing. They're trained to go and then be able to to react to a multiple set of situations where they may or may not get help depending on where they are. So behind enemy lines and a covert mission, things like that. So I see hoverfly. I see I see a very agile, very adaptable group of of people. Um, engineers, electronic techs, the whole support staff. Uh, we work together as one team, and it's the the drone space is is just moving so fast. If you're not adaptable, you're going to die. And so, I see Hoverfly as a very high performing team. We've moved so quickly, we've changed directions, and we keep performing well, and we keep accomplishing the mission that we set out to do. So, since the very beginning of Hoverfly. Um, we've had a culture here of engineering uh, and innovation and uh, being able to come together, brainstorm, and then realize, um, you know, the most fantastic ideas. The very beginning was only a group of four or five people, uh, and we had a really good team. Each person uh, brought to the table something that the company needed. Even today, with as many employees as we have today, that team is still very full. It's, it has people from all different experiences, all bringing to what, they, what they know to the table and bringing products to market. So really my favorite part of the company is still the team and the camaraderie that we, we all share. We all have a vision and I think everyone at Hoverfly uh, goes home at night believing they did something meaningful and knowing that we have something special here. So every April we try to fly something far outside the bounds of multi-rotor flight and what you think is possible. So this year we have the tricopter lift body, which I'm fairly sure has never been tried before. So the idea is that typically on a multi-rotor, you have half of the rotor spinning clockwise and half spinning counterclockwise. This has all clockwise spinning blades. And in addition, they're all tilted just a little bit. So this is made to spin. And the idea is that it'll be more efficient because it's the combination of a, a lifting surface with the multi-rotors. There it is! Definitely my favorite part about Hoverfly is the team. We all have come together, we're doing something really meaningful, uh, and there's just a special feeling here. There's a lot of camaraderie, and uh, I, I think there's a, just a common belief that we're doing something that's important and we're doing it together. And that's my favorite part. It worked perfectly. Um, all of our calculations, CAD models, finite element analysis, and it flew uh, really perfectly. I think, I honestly think this is the future of multi-rotors. Uh, once this is in carbon fiber, obviously anything in carbon fiber works much better. So, um, you know, we're not far along or far away from uh, having a complete production ready unit. Yeah, my favorite part about Hoverfly is, is the culture. And it's and culture's a complicated thing and it's not something that's easy to build. And, and it's not something that you, you go out and craft day by day. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it morphs and it changes as you hire new people and you have new leadership and it's constantly changing. But you do as a leader have to f be very focused on the culture of the company. So we have a culture of innovation and 
innovation doesn't come from one person or one leader uh, or one visionary. It comes as a collaborative effort of, of, a, of a bunch of minds working towards one goal, but, but also in an environment where you're, you're not afraid to fail. You're not afraid to try new things. You're not afraid to, to think differently than other people or other companies. And we have that here. The only way we're ever going to get to the vision that I have in my mind for the company would be a failure in my vision for the company. Because you, you can't set a goal that is easily achievable or you know you're going to get you know you're going to get there. You don't build something great by having a goal that you is easily achievable. You have to set your target, you have to set it out beyond the horizon and strive to get there. And as you keep getting a little bit closer to it, you have to just keep pushing that target further and further out so that the vision in your mind of where you want to be is never where you are. It's always out there beyond the horizon. You always have something to, to drive for. So I, I think uh, as rapidly as we're growing, there's no doubt in my mind we're going to be much bigger than we are. We're probably going to be triple our size. We're going to be um, if, not, if not more, and we're going to be selling thousands of drones. The next five years is going to be the really fun, uphill part of the roller coaster. Uh, we'll begin to productize some of the new technologies that we've, we've been working on, and I think it's going to revolutionize um, the markets we're in, uh, and maybe some new markets. Those who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are usually the ones that do. And I, I see that, I see the passion and the dedication in our guys and our folks here. Um, and and that's, that's a thrill to me, I just love it. Some people ask me, uh, you know, could you possibly have imagined all of this, what you've achieved today with the company, uh, when you started it 12 years ago? And you know, the honest answer is, if if we didn't have uh, the founders, some uh, belief that we would get to this point, we wouldn't have started. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a hard one. So, um, so that's a good question. <laughs> um, we um, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> well, you know, uh, you can cut that out. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was really deep. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I might have to do mine over too after I look at it. <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> you can just freeze frame there. <laughs> uh, what do I want to say? Um, you know, uh, I'm going to start over. I didn't write this down, obviously. Yeah, that's okay. Should never write it down. Yeah. I want it to be genuine, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it, it just sounded like fun at the time. <laughs> Um, I was also a professor for a long time, so you know, I gotta, it's got to be correct. Okay. <laughs> that is going in there, and that is, that is amazing. It's all in the editing, right? Yeah. Oh, I hope it all wasn't too stiff. Okay, good. <laughs> that, you know, everything is either growing and expanding or shrinking or dying. Uh, you know, now Comorex Kesterex, as they say in Klingon. <laughs>